Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Tony DeBell, and welcome to this Global ACS webcast. I'm joined today by Sandra Thompson and Gary Berkowitz. Our plan for the next 45 minutes or so is to focus on the accounting issue that is most relevant to our stakeholders at the moment. And that's the accounting implications of the coronavirus and the measures taken both to control the spread of the virus and to support businesses and economies. The spread of the virus and its consequences for businesses and financial reporting was largely a non-adjusting event for 31st December reporting dates. There were obvious implications for disclosure, but little impact on accounting. This is no longer the case, and careful thought across a range of accounting issues will be required for 31st March reporting dates. Management of most entities will be required to make accounting judgments and make accounting estimates against a background of pervasive uncertainty about what's going to happen next and how long it will last. I'm therefore going to ask Gary and Sandra to talk about the areas of accounting most affected, impairment of financial and then non-financial assets, accounting for some of the support provided by governments around the world, the implications for the going concern assessment and interim reporting. We'll start by talking about the issue that is top of many people's list, which is the impairment of financial assets. Sandra. Yeah, thank you very much, Tony. And as you said, this is the biggest area where we're getting the most questions and think top of many people's lists. And I should say at the outset, this is equally relevant for banks and corporates. Sometimes people tend to think, oh, impairment of financial assets, surely that's all about banks. But actually it impacts corporates as well. They have things like trade receivables, contract assets, perhaps lease receivables, loans to joint ventures, associates or subsidiaries. Those can all be impacted. So why is this the top of everybody's list? Well, IFRS 9's impairment model is an expected credit loss model. Expected, it's in the word, it's a forward-looking model. It requires entities to use reasonable and supportable information about past events, current conditions, but also future conditions, including future economic conditions. I think it's fairly clear there's plenty of reasonable and supportable information that COVID-19 has impacted current conditions, but also will impact going forwards. However, there is an awful lot of uncertainty about quite how COVID-19 will play out, how long it will last, how quick the recovery will be when it comes, which means that estimating an ECL, certainly at the 31st of March, is going to be very judgmental. One thing to note up front is this requirement to use forward-looking information impacts both what we call staging, so whether a loan or other exposures in stage one versus stage two or three, and also measuring the expected credit loss. And I'm going to talk about both of those separately, and then I'll come on to give a few thoughts about disclosure at the end. So if we start off with the staging question, what do I mean by that? Well, if an asset is in stage one of the model, then the ECL is measured at a 12-month ECL. If there's been a significant increase in credit risk, then the asset moves into stage two or three of the model, and the ECL is measured at a lifetime ECL. As I said, that all depends on whether there's been a significant increase in credit risk. Now, the area that's given us most questions at the moment is about payment holidays. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes. And most of the payment holidays we're seeing, interest continues to accrue through the period of the holiday. So I'm going to focus on those. There might be additional considerations if interest is forgiven or principal is forgiven. But let's start with the, the more normal case. Now, if you think of pre, about a pre-COVID-19 environment, Generally, a payment holiday would have indicated that the borrower was in financial difficulty and would have moved the exposure from stage one to stage two or three. Payment holidays pre-COVID-19 were generally granted to borrowers who most needed them, who were in financial difficulty, on a kind of loan by loan basis. And after quite a lot of analysis of the loan and the financial situation of the borrower. If we now move into our COVID-19 environment, that's no longer the case. We still do have some payment holidays of that nature, particularly larger loans, larger exposures. There may be that detailed analysis. It's clear that the borrower is in financial difficulty and those will still tip the exposures into stage two or three of the model. But we also have a number of blanket payment holidays where relief's being offered to an entire group of borrowers, for example, all mortgage loans or all loans to small and medium entities. And there the process can be largely automated because borrowers are facing so many requests and they want to process them quickly, a borrower may merely need to click on a link on a bank's website, answer a couple of questions, and they automatically get the payment holiday. And I think for those blanket payment holidays, 
then it's not necessarily the case that all of the exposures move into stage two of the model. For some of those borrowers, they may just have a temporary cash flow shortage, a temporary liquidity need, but their lifetime credit risk actually hasn't increased very much at all. So therefore they might validly stay in stage one. However, not all borrowers will be in that category. And for some of those borrowers who've applied for that bank it payment holiday, they will actually have suffered a significant increase in credit risk. And therefore it's important that, that borrowers, sorry, lenders in that circumstance distinguish which category borrowers are in. So therefore it's in, probably gonna be inappropriate to move all the loans into stage two or three, but it's also equally inappropriate to leave them all in stage one. The other thing to think about when it comes to staging is government relief programs. We've seen a number of government programs. Some are targeted at borrowers and some are targeted at lenders. So the ones targeted at borrowers, for example, may pay an individual salary if they've been furloughed because of COVID-19, or they may give a loan to a small business because that business has to be shut temporarily. Now, they may actually enable the borrower not to default. They're giving the borrower enough cash that they won't default in the first place and those do impact staging. On the other hand, we have some reliefs targeted at lenders. An example would be a financial guarantee given by government. So if the borrower does default, then the government will pick up some or the loss. Now those do not impact staging because staging is based on the probability of default, not the loss that happens if there is a default. So you need to think about the payment holiday, sorry, you need to think about government reliefs, but they're not all the same. The second area I want to talk a bit is actually how to measure the ECL once you've done your staging. Now, typically an ECL measurement has three components and they're all going to be impacted by COVID-19. The first is what's the probability the borrower doesn't pay, the probability of default, and all the factors I've just talked about are relevant there. The second is if the borrower does default, how much exposure does the lender have? What's actually exposed? And that too will be impacted by COVID-19. So many businesses are us drawing down on any unused credit facilities they've got, or retail customers might be maxing out on their credit cards, or in the corporate environment, some of their customers may be taking longer to pay. So therefore the amount that's exposed, if there is a default, has got bigger. And then the third area to think about is if there is a default, what percentage of the exposure will be lost? We sometimes call that the loss given default. Now that too is likely to be impacted by COVID-19 particularly for collateralized loans, because the value of the collateral may well have fallen. So you can see COVID-19 is having a pr pretty pervasive impact. How practically could you incorporate the impact of COVID-19? Well, many entities had a base case macroeconomic scenario that will need to be updated. For corporates who've used something like a, um, a provisions matrix, they need to update their matrix. They can't look at, at past rates of default. They need to update for the new economic environment we're now in. You can't stop there. So in addition, you need to think about additional scenarios, not just the base case. You may need to build additional downside scenarios. You might need to change the weightings between the base case and the downsides. And to the extent it's not really practical to do that in your main model, particularly at March 2020, given all the uncertainty, it's perfectly acceptable to do what we call an overlay, some kind of top side post model adjustment that reflects the factors you need to think about. And then finally, government reliefs. And here, when you come to measuring the ECL, both kinds of government relief are relevant, whether they're targeted at the borrower or the lender. If they reduce the, the, measure, the actual loss in the event of a default, then that is relevant and that should be taken into account. Then the third aspect is to think about disclosure. Now, given all the uncertainty, I think disclosure is critical. I really can't emphasize too much the importance of good disclosure. And that means that the entity tells its story. It's not just boilerplate. What are some of the areas to focus on? Well, first, the inputs and assumptions and how they've changed. Um, have you changed your staging criteria? What have you assumed about the length of, of the COVID-19 impact and what the recovery will look like afterwards? Also think about credit risk concentrations. What customers are you exposed to? And you might need to give more detail here than you did previously. So previously you might have disclosed exposures to the transport sector. Now you may need to disaggregate those into say airlines that are clearly quite heavily impacted and something like road freight transport that might be much less impact there. And think about credit risk management practices. Have those changed? Are you granting payment holidays? Alternatively, are you requiring all your customers now to pay cash up front? 
because that's clearly going to have an impact on the ECL. And then finally, I think for many entities, ECL is now going to be a critical accounting estimate, even if it wasn't previously. So make sure you give the IS1 additional disclosures. Think about sensitivities. You might not be able to do them on a numerical basis, but some qualitative information about how things might look different depending on how COVID-19 plays out. That's likely to be very relevant at this point in time. Thanks for that, Sandra. Very helpful and clearly top of mind for many. But there are also implications for the impairment of non-financial assets. So Gary, is this one that you can pick up? Yeah, thanks, Tony. And uh, this is the first uh, webcast I'm doing with you and Sandra, and I, I never thought I'd be doing it in this uh, type of condition. So, um, yeah, definitely crazy times for everyone. But picking up on the points that you, you asked me to, to talk about, I think it's probably worth first saying we're well, talking about whether or not an entity would actually take into account the impact of COVID-19 when they look at the recoverability of their uh, non-financial assets at the reporting period date. And again, worth picking up one of the points you mentioned at the intro, Tony, which was at December 2019, uh, we probably all accepted that COVID-19 was not yet a condition that should be taken into account in any material way when considering the recoverability of non-financial assets. I think if you fast forward to 31 March uh, 2020, folks will almost likely agree that it is an aspect that should be taken into account when considering the recoverability of your non-financial assets. And I think the question that we're, we're receiving from people at the moment is, what if I'm somewhere in between that spectrum? So if you're an entity that has a reporting end date of 31 January or 29 February, should you take into account the impact of COVID-19 in a material way when considering the recoverability of your non-financial assets? And I think here where we've gotten to is, we don't think there's necessarily a bright line. We think this is likely a judgment. Some of the things you may want to take into account when making that judgment, though, would be, for example, where you are from a time period in that spectrum. So what I mean, what I mean by that is an entity with a, a January 31 uh, period end uh, would be less likely to take into account the impact of COVID-19 as a significant event, uh, as opposed to an entity with a 29 February period end. Uh, other things you may want to think about are the territory that you operate in. So again, as an example, if you had an entity that's operating in China, for example, they want, might take into account the impact of COVID-19 when thinking about the impairment of their non-financial assets earlier than an entity which operated in a territory where uh, it emerged at a later period in, in time. A couple of other factors folks may want to think about, the industry that you operate in, as Sandra said, that'll have an impact um, on, on how, how quickly you thought you would be impacted as well as your customer base, where are they located, um, your suppliers, uh, your supply chain and potential disruptions to that supply chain uh, and when that happened as a result of, of COVID-19. So I think the takeaway there, no, no bright lines, but a judgment and there's, there's a spectrum and folks may want to think about how they make that judgment and be clear on, on the disclosure thereof. So if I move on to the second point on the slide, which is assuming you're in a position where you've decided you do need to take COVID-19 into account um, when considering the recoverability or measurement of your, your non-financial assets. A couple of things to bear in mind. The first and most obvious would be as a result of COVID-19, there's been a clear increase in risk um, with respect to recoverability of those assets. And if you think about it, increase in risk is generally associated with a, a decrease in the net present value of cash flows. And so as a result, the risk of impairment and the expectation that there may be impairments will likely have increased to the extent folks are taking COVID-19 into account in their assessments. Um, another point to remember, which is, is uh, not COVID-19 related, but a, a general principle in IS-36 that's worth uh, reminding folks about, which is don't double count the risk. So to the extent you've incorporated the risk of COVID-19 into your discount rate, for example, don't then uh, include that again in your cash flows and depress those cash flows for expectations about reduced um, reduced cash flows if it's already been incorporated into, into the risk. Staying on that same topic of how you might think about doing your impairment analyses or your value and use uh, impairment tests, uh, remember that you can do it in one of two ways. You can either adjust the discount rate or you can adjust your cash flows with an expected cash flow uh, probability weighted model 
I think a practical, this is my, probably my first key takeaway, a practical point we're, we're suggesting to folks is, in this case, it's probably more practical and a superior solution to use scenario analyses that uh, adjust the cash flows for the, for the increased risk as a result of COVID-19, rather than trying to bake all of that uncertainty of which there is a huge amount into a single adjustment in the discount rate. So we find it's actually an easier analysis to do if you consider multiple cash flow scenarios. And it also makes it easier to adjust those to the extent that you have um, adjusting post balance sheet uh, events, uh, information that needs to adjust the, the, the models. So something practical to think about if you're preparing those, those impairment uh, calculations, probably best to go with uh, probability weighted uh, cash flows. Another point that's worth mentioning for folks is uh, you may folks will remember you need to do an impairment test of goodwill annually, but that doesn't mean that you don't test again if there's been an impairment trigger. And so for some folks who may test their goodwill uh, earlier in the year and now they're coming to their period end in, in February or March, to the extent that there's been an impairment trigger, you would be required to test your goodwill uh, for a second time potentially during the year and that may lead to, to an impairment at this stage. But I guess the uh, IS36 is not the only standard we need to think about when we're thinking about recoverability of assets. Um, inventories may be significant for some folks, and there are obviously the, the, the most obvious uh, requirements is that inventories need to be carried at the lower of cost and net realizable value. So again, to the extent that uh, the impact of COVID-19 has, has had an impact on your customer base and your demand for your products, you may be in a situation where you need to consider the obsolescence risk of your inventory and you may have to have to unfortunately record a write down of that inventory. A more subtle point I think related to inventory that, that folks may want to be aware of is your overhead absorption into your inventory. So you may recall that some folks use standard costing um, and the result of that is that your overheads are absorbed into your inventory on a normal expected production basis. Again, as a result of COVID-19, we're seeing some entities or many entities scale back on their level of production of inventory because the demand is reduced. And as a result, you may not be in a position where you've produced enough inventory to actually absorb all of your overheads in the reporting period. And some of those overheads will now need to be recognized um, as an expense in the current period. Then maybe I'll get on to my, my second key takeaway, which is still under, under how you look about this from a measurement perspective, and that is consistency of the assumptions that you might make. And so clearly you'll be testing uh, the recoverability of your non-financial assets in different standards. So you might be thinking about inventory, you might be thinking about recoverability of deferred tax assets, you may be testing goodwill. Again, as Sandra mentioned, you may actually be testing your financial assets. And I think the key point that we'd like to just stress here is that there may be nuances around how you do the testing but your base assumptions and your modeling should be consistent between those different models. And another thing that's probably worthwhile to see is that from an operational perspective, we see a lot of C-suite management actually looking at scenario analyses from a business operational perspective, not so much from a reporting perspective. And again, there's different functions within an entity that may be looking at recoverability of certain assets from a reporting perspective, as opposed to different functions in the entity that are actually looking at operational um, continuation. And again, our advice here would be please ensure to the extent possible that the different functions of your business are speaking so that you are looking at the same assumptions from a consistency perspective. One last point then I'd like to make, which is just on disclosure. And I think people are probably gonna think we sound like broken records by the end of this webcast, but it really is critical at this stage. There's a massive amount of uncertainty and uh, that'll exist both at the date of testing your non-financial financial assets for impairments as well as thereafter. And I think disclosure will be key in this respect, both in terms of the transparency around the assumptions that management have used to determine the recoverability of those assets. Um, and, and in addition to that, the sensitivity analyses there are. So I think there's IS36 is I think the only standard that mandates sensitivity analysis, and that's normally only specific to Goodwill. But I think in the current environment we're in, folks should really consider whether or not you want to provide incremental sensitivity analyses on the impairment testing or recoverability testing you've done on your, on your assets. Letting, letting investors know how much headroom there is or how much additional impairment there may be depending on 
when significant inputs move, I think will also be key. Thanks for that, Gary. Very clear and very helpful. Now, you've both talked about the impact of the measures taken to control the spread of the virus and the impact of those measures on future cash flows and on the recoverability of assets. But I think there's another issue here, and it's something that Sandra talked about, which is the measures taken by governments around the world to support businesses and to support the economy. And I wondered if we might spend a few minutes talking about how we think about the accounting for this, maybe starting with Sandra and some of the assistance that's been provided to banks. Yeah, thank you very much, Tony. As you said, this is another key area. So the first thing to note is we are seeing lots of different types of government relief programs. Many, many territories now, the government's giving some kind of relief and they're all slightly different. So it's really important that you look at the exact terms and the facts and circumstances. What Gary and I are gonna do is to talk through some of the most common examples in, in kind of broad groups. So as Tony said, I'm gonna start with banks and I'm actually gonna go a little bit broader with banks and also talk about some of the, the government programs that involve governments lending to businesses. Now, I think these kind of reliefs fit into two types. So the first is governments giving guarantees of loans. I mentioned those a few minutes ago. So this will be the case where if a bank, for example, has a loan and the borrower defaults, the government picks up some or all of the loss. The second kind, flipping over to the liability side of the balance sheet, is governments lending. Either governments lending to banks to put liquidity into the system, give the economy a boost, or alternatively lending to businesses to tie them over a cash flow difficult period. Now, for all of these kinds of reliefs, the obvious question is, well, is this a government grant? Does the government grant standard apply? And if so, what does that mean? Um, and I think there are three things to think about. The first is, is this a government grant? So is it on favourable or off market terms? And here there can be an element of judgment. So it's not always clear what are market terms, for example, a, a government lending to a bank to increase liquidity in the system or a government lending to a business due to a global pandemic. Um, if you conclude there is a element of government grant, having made that judgment, the second thing to think about is, does it meet the criteria for recognition? So is there reasonable assurance that the entity will actually get the benefit? Now here we've got lots of programmes that have been announced. Sometimes the detail is very clear, sometimes it's quite unclear. It's quite unclear who will qualify, on what terms and when. So you need to think about those. And again, there may be some judgments to be made. And then if you get through those first two hurdles, the final question is, well, how does that impact the measurement and recognition in particular? What's the timing of recognition of the grant by the recipient? And here it's important to know that IS20 is essentially a matching standard. So you figure out what the grant was designed to compensate for and you book the benefit in the same period. So for example, if it's a financial guarantee and it's compensating for an impairment loss, then you book the relief in the same period as you book the impairment loss. On the other hand, if it's designed to put liquidity in the system, um, so therefore to be a, a, a favourable, if you like, lending rate for a bank, then you book the benefit over the period of the interest expense spent on that lending. Gary, shall I pass over to you to talk about leases? Thanks, Sandra. So, yeah, as you said, I'll pick up leases and as you mentioned, you know, these, these arrangements can be varied, but maybe I'll talk broadly to some of the principles and, and issues that we're seeing from an accounting perspective. So in many cases, we're seeing that um, commercial lessors might receive some form of compensation or, or relief from a local government with a, a strong suggestion or a, or a legal requirement that they need to undistribute some or all of that relief to, to their uh, related lessees. And I'd like to highlight maybe two points related to these, to these types of arrangements that folks should bear in mind. The first point I think picks up what you mentioned, Sandra, which is IS20 is a, it's, its key principle with respect to income grants is that it's a matching, it's a matching principle. And so you're actually trying to achieve matching for the related expense, as you mentioned, Sandra. And therefore, what's quite important is that if you're a lessor, you actually need to look at the the standard that's going to drive the reduction in your rental income with your lessee before you can work out how you should recognize the related grant income. And so the standard that will be applicable in almost all cases will actually be IFRS 16. And so even though we start with a government grant, you actually are going to need to go to IFRS 16 to determine the recognition pattern for the reduction in any of that related rental income, because that will drive how the lessor 
should effectively recognize their government grant or the pattern of recognition of that government grant, provided that the other recognition criteria that you mentioned, Sandra, are, 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 are achieved. So, and, and in cases we're seeing a lessor and a lessee might renegotiate the terms of their lease as a result of COVID-19, or the lessor might just grant the lessee a concession of some sort in connection with the lease payments. And it can get very complicated um, with respect to how you might treat that. But as I say, the starting point is go to I-316 before you can work out the recognition pattern for the government grant. The other thing that's worth mentioning, which is again, a, a quirk that's come out of this that we haven't had to think about before with respect to I-20, is that sometimes the conditions that are imposed by the government on the lessors um, with respect to the incentives or reliefs that they are providing is so restrictive that it actually calls into question whether or not the lessor is actually the party that receives the government grant, or whether rather, in fact, the lessor is, is merely acting as a conduit or an agent on behalf of the government, and actually the lessee is the counterparty that receives the government grant. Uh, and there again, I think it's going to be an area of judgment, but what we have uh, um, what we have decided that may be helpful to folks is that you probably want to look at some IFRS 15 guidance with respect to agent principle. That may be helpful to consider in terms of determining whether or not it's the lessor or the lessee who should be deemed to be the counterparty for the government grant and considering the, the principle of control. So two areas to think about. Thanks, Gary. Um, and moving on a little bit and, and changing tack, perhaps, uh, I think, unfortunately, and despite the best efforts of governments and others, I think it's likely that there might be some entities that will struggle to survive. Uh, Gary, what are the accounting implications of that? Thanks, Tony. Um, and yeah, it, it clearly is a difficult period for, for a lot of folks. And I think uh, before we get into going concern, it's probably worthwhile just um, reminding ourselves what the definition of, of, of the going concern assumption is. So again, our standard defines an entity as no longer being a going concern when it, it plans to cease trading, to liquidate, or it has no realistic alternative but to liquidate or cease trading within the next 12 months. So, you know, at a minimum, it's a 12-month it's a forward-looking assessment. I think what's also important when when making the determination on the going concern assessment is that all subsequent events, so events after our period, reporting period date, but before the issuance of the financial statements, so all of those subsequent events are deemed to be adjusting. So management and their auditors will need to continually assess the developments of COVID-19 all the way through to the authorization or issuance of the financial statements. And to the extent that there is information, both positive or negative, that impacts an entity's assessment of the going concern assumption, that would need to be taken into account um, in the financial statement. So a special uh, principle or rule for going concern, everything is, is, needs to be taken into account. Uh, another important point is, even if management um, determines that it, it does make sense that the business is still a going concern, hopefully that is the case, but if management is aware in making that assessment that there are potentially material uncertainties relating to COVID-19 that, that will, may cast um, significant doubt on that assumption or on the entity's ability to continue as a going concern, I think, again, then the disclosure around those uncertainties is absolutely critical in terms of what, what might be the key uh, assumptions that could change either positively or negatively uh, in the foreseeable future that might bring that the going concern uh, assumption into, into further question. So again, both in terms of uh, the two key points, I think there, think about the, the, the subsequent events all the way through. And again, disclosure will be key to the extent that uh, there is material uncertainty. Yeah, thanks, Gary. And, and, and you said that one of the key issues to think about in the context of going concern is disclosure. Now that made me think about another question for you, um, which is which is around disclosure and the fact that there are going to be many entities that will have to account for the implications of the virus in an interim report. So what sort of things should management be thinking about when they're considering an interim report rather than a complete set of financial statements? Thanks, thanks, Tony. That's a, another good question. I think it's it's very relevant because in in calendar Q one of twenty twenty. 
it's likely that the majority of entities will have uh, interim reports rather than annual reports. And so IS34, our standard on interim reporting is probably going to be very relevant in this regard. I think there's a couple of points that are worth making there. The first is, is that we're applying the same measurements and recognition requirements in our interim report as you would in our annual financial statements. So if you think about potential restructuring plans that management may be thinking about or unfortunate redundancies that they may be thinking about, we have the same recognition criteria in your interims as we would have in your annuals. So you need to have a present obligation, the example I just provided before you could book a liability. But that is the principle that we're using the same recognition and measurement requirements in our interims as we are in our annuals. A couple of nuances, though, or subtleties that folks may want to be aware of when doing that is if you have, for example, impairment of an asset and that asset is not deductible for tax purposes, you may want to think about the potential adjustment that uh, may have when you're estimating your effective tax rate at the interim reporting period. Another nuanced uh, point that folks may want to remember is IFRIC 10. <laughs> this, uh, you know, we've, we've dusted off a couple of interpretations that we haven't needed for a while, but IFRIC 10 is our interpretation on impairment testing of goodwill. And what's important there is if you are in an interim period and you identify an impairment of goodwill and you book that impairment, if at the end of your reporting period, so end of your annual reporting period, hopefully conditions have reversed and we're in a better relative position, if you would no longer have had the impairments at your annual reporting period date, if RIC 10 is clear that you cannot reverse the impairment you may have booked at your interim reporting date. And so I think to the extent folks are looking at that, uh, looking at potential impairments of goodwill, it makes sense to involve uh, a, a degree of rigor and potentially getting the auditors more involved than they would be at an interim reporting period date because whatever that impairment is, it's at least going to be the same impairment at your annual reporting period. One other point that I'd really like to stress, and again, I am sounding like a broken record, apologies, but is, is disclosure in your interim financial statements. Now, normally our, our interim financial statements are summarized, but it's worthwhile remembering the key principle in IS34, which is really it's focusing on new information and new relevant information that has occurred since the most recent annual reporting period or previous interim. And I think, as I, as I mentioned before, the, the pace at which the change is happening with respect to COVID-19 means that there is likely a heck of a lot of new relevant information since the last interim or annual reporting period that an entity may have provided. And so things to bear in mind, you really want to be clear on what the impact of COVID-19 may be on, the res on your results, your balance sheet, your cash flows, and the steps taken to control um, the, the negative impact of that and the spread of the virus. Any significant judgments that were not required previously, um, for example, in connection, as Sandra said, with expected credit losses, uh, updates to the disclosures and any of your significant estimates that may have changed since your last reporting period, and also very important, uh, what's gonna be a key disclosure here is your subsequent events note in your interim reports Remember that that is most likely going to be key because things are changing in, on such a such a rapid uh, basis. So, again, I, I, I think that our interim reports, the key takeaway, will be far more voluminous than we may have expected during more normal times. Okay, thank you for that. I think now's <clears throat> probably a good time for us to move on to look at some of the questions we've received. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll start with Sandra, because one of the things you said right at the beginning is that um, um, the expected credit loss calculation is based on there being reasonable and supportable information. So is there really reasonable and supportable information against this background of uncertainty? Yeah, thanks, Tony. That's a very good question and one I have been asked. I, I think the answer is yes. There clearly has been an impact. I think it would not be reasonable and supportable, if you like, to put your head in the sand and pretend that COVID-19 isn't happening. Um, it can be very judgmental to estimate the ECL, but it's not impossible. I think the key is that the entity makes best use of the information it's got available. And we might come on to that in some of the other questions, but I think the entities do have a number of sources of information. Some of those are external. For example, I know Moody's has updates its forecasts. Some of those are internal, what it knows about its own borrowers. And indeed, the ISB put a document out um, that confirmed that you should reflect changes in economic conditions. So I think everyone's saying, yes, this is reasonable and supportable. You need to do something, even though it might be hard. Right. 
Okay, thank you for that. And I've, I've, I've got a, um, a question for Gary here as well, which is <clears throat> things are happening very fast at the moment. Things are changing. Governments are making announcements. To what extent can developments after the reporting date be reflected in the assumptions that are made at the reporting date in connection with the impairment of non-financial assets? Uh, thanks, Tony. That is that is a difficult question, but it is a question we are receiving um, fairly regularly. I think, it, again, a lot of it will depend. If you think of our, our, our standard on adjusting events after the reporting date, you really need to ask yourself, are the developments that are occurring after the reporting period date providing me with more information about a condition that existed at the at the reporting date. So in this case, if you can if you can get comfortable that the development that occurs after the reporting period date is giving you more information about COVID-19 and the impacts thereof, which existed at the balance sheet date, you will most likely be able to take those adjustments into account when considering the impact on your recoverability or impairments of your non-financial assets. Now, clearly there is a judgment around whether or not those developments are new discrete events or whether or not they're providing you more information about the condition that already existed at the balance sheet date. But I think it is something that, that management should definitely take into account when thinking about their, their impairment testing of non-financial assets. So Sandra, back to you. And you talked quite a lot previously about um, payment holidays and the impact particularly on uh, staging in the context of an ECL model. So do you have any practical observations about things that people could think about um, around considering the impact of payment holidays? Um, yeah, thanks, Tony. That's another great question and one I think a number of entities, particularly the banks, are, are grappling with at the moment. Um, as I said, the aim is to differentiate between those borrowers who've got some temporary liquidity issue, but actually haven't suffered an increase in credit risk from those who have a, a more permanent credit risk issue. Um, now, there are a number of tools in the toolbox, if you like, it's probably not a one size fits all, and it goes back to making the best use of the data you've got. So in some cases, there might be a loan by loan assessment, particularly for the larger loans, clearly in that case, use it. In many cases, there won't be. And then I think it goes back to what do you know about the borrower? Some things to think about is how close were they to having a significant increase in credit risk pre-COVID-19? So how close were they, if you like, to the age? Does COVID-19 tip them over? Um, do you know what sector they're in? We all know that some sectors are more, in, are more affected than others, particularly for um, corporate loans. You might move more or indeed an entirety of, of certain sectors into stage two. Um, what was their overall indebtedness? Um, and certainly for retail customers, banks might know more about the additional indebtedness in addition to something like a mortgage that a borrower has. And, and that will impact when they get through the COVID-19 period. What does their overall indebtedness look like and can they meet that? Um, do they qualify for the relief programmes? So a number of factors to think about. I think it goes back to making the best use of the data you've got. And I said often that will be on a collective basis, not a loan by loan basis at this stage. Excellent. Thank you for that. And I've got, a, a, I guess, a similar question now for uh, Gary, which is, uh, again, it gets to the just just the, the, the pervasive uncertainty. And, and someone's asked, well, how can I possibly incorporate all of that uncertainty into my forecasts about um, my, my future cash flows and, and, and maybe the way I think about the discount rate? Tony, yeah, thanks. And I think that that's a great question because it, it actually ties back to one of the points I think I made earlier on around how folks may want to do the impairment testing or think about it. Because if you are trying to incorporate all of that uncertainty and expectation of the multiple scenarios that might be occurring into a single discount rate, it's going to be very, very, very difficult. And that's why I think, as I mentioned before, what probably makes more sense in this context is to actually think about plotting out multiple scenarios, as you said. So one of those scenarios may be, this is my base case of expectation of cash flows. I'm going to assume a 20% probability to that. And my discount rate is not going to be adjusted for the increased risk or uncertainty related to COVID-19. Then I've got another scenario, a cash flow analysis in which it goes for three months, as you say, and that's the scenario, best case, where we come out of this and return to normalcy shortly thereafter. But there's a 20% probability of that happening. But then you plot another scenario where unfortunately it's a worst case scenario where this lasts for longer and is 
a lot more depressing to the cash flows in business. And I think it's really building out all of those different scenarios and assigning probabilities to them is a more practical and probably feasible way of, of building in all of the risk and uncertainty than potentially looking at adjusting for a single discount rate. One of the points I'd probably like to stress there is again, just the internal consistency around how you might think about your assumptions. So again, if you're starting to say, I don't think this is gonna last more than three months, my long-term growth rate is going to incorporate the fact that we've come out of COVID-19. You need to be consistent with how you think about that assumption compared to how you think about what you might be uh, applying to your discount rates if the current yield on, on uh, government bonds has gone down. So consistency, and as a, a reiterating my point, probably weighted average cash flows is the, is the more practical and feasible way of doing this. Right. Okay, thanks for that. And I, I, I think um, uh, some very helpful thoughts. I've got one final question for, um, for Sandra first, and then I'll ask one to Gary, which I think will just both give you an opportunity to re-emphasize some of the key points you've made. And so, so starting with Sandra, um, what key practical points would you make about the calculation of the ECL overall? It goes back to really making the best use of the data available. And I said that can be external data, some macroeconomic data, but also internal data because you probably have more than you think. Um, I've talked a lot about banks, but if you're a corporate and you're doing something like updating a provisions matrix, what happened in the last recession? That's likely to give you some useful information. For a bank, you've probably done some stress tests. What information can you get from your stress testing? Maybe one of the downsides you used previously now looks like the base case, so use it. And all the, the in, information you've got about individual loans and borrowers that like I also mentioned and the sectors, etc. So I think it is, it's going to be judgmental. So make the best use of the data you've got and then link to that. And we said this so many times, disclosure. Disclose what you've done, some of the sensitivities and the, the, the alternative assumptions in there. And really tell your story. Thanks for that. And I think your final point is a really good segue into the, 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 the final question I had for, for, for Gary, which is uh, an opportunity to see whether his, his record is still broken. Um, Gary, do you have any final observations around disclosures? Thanks, Tony. And I think Sandra's, Sandra's point is probably spot on, which is, uh, you know, there's, there, I think we all need to acknowledge there's a, there's a huge degree of uncertainty. You know, will, will management and the entities be able to have a crystal ball and know what's coming? I, I think not. And I think people are aware of that, but the way in which that can be mitigated and the way in which we can ensure that markets are still able to make good investment decisions and reliable investment decisions is ensuring that the disclosures around those assumptions are transparent and clear and comprehensive and that management has also provided a fair amount of sensitivity around those assumptions so that folks can form their own views to the extent that they think the the actual outcome will be different from management i think the last point i'd make is that doesn't always mean you need to provide quantitative numbers i think we need to acknowledge and we have seen that practically it may not be possible to provide numbers for everything but I think what's important is the quality of the qualitative disclosure that is provided to the extent that you cannot provide actual numbers. So uh, my, 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 my final point, disclosure, disclosure, good disclosure. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, I think we're probably just about out of time now. So um, special thanks to Sandra and to Gary for your insights. Um, I think the thing that has resonated most with me from our discussion is that so many aspects of the accounting and the judgments and the estimates and so forth that management has to make in today's environment are affected by uncertainty. The standards um, that we're all familiar with actually provide a really good basis to address all of these issues, but all of the judgments and estimates management makes are going to have to be made against that background of pervasive uncertainty. Uh, and, and to repeat what Gary said, that means that good disclosure about the assumptions that have been made, the basis for judgments and estimates and so forth is going to be even more important than usual. So, so that's it from us. We hope this webcast will help you navigate some of the key issues. If you have any further questions, please email us at uh, uk underscore ifrs at pwc.com. And we'll have a look at them and we're planning another webcast to address some of those questions, some more implications of the virus in the near future. Thanks very much for watching.